measurement of speed. <clears throat> now, I've given talks previously on longitudinal format, which is what we had up until the middle of last year, into the middle of 2006. Pretty much since 2006 till now, almost every single hard drive has switched to perpendicular recording. And what this means is, is that instead of writing our patterns long ways across the disk, like we have done for 50 years, we're now going to write them up and down. And there were some minor changes in the head that were needed to happen to make this the way it's supposed to be, but physically it has duplicated our size. Almost every single thing that happens now is a two to one ratio. So in a lot of cases, you had native hard drives up to say 500 gigs, and then you get a terabyte, it's basically a perpendicular 500 gig hard drive and gives us twice the space. Um, it, it depends on laptop hard drives, which size that you're dealing with, but you know, an 80 gig becomes a 160 gig hard drive and so on and so on. So you have a higher density with a change in the head. It makes it a little bit harder to keep your head aligned if you're going to take your head out and try to put it back in your drive. But it can be done. Uh, it just takes a little bit more care. But one of the biggest changes that happened was before uh, 2006, we had a variety of different materials that were used to make the platters. The platters could have been uh, tin, aluminum, a number of different things. IBM has typically used a ceramic glass platter and basically what happened now when they went to perpendicular, they've got to write down through the platter's material, so everybody had to switch to a glass ceramic type of material because aluminum and other metals interfere with the electronics themselves and how much resistance you have. So the substrate now at the bottom basically is what we're looking at where it has now gone to a glass ceramic platter. The unique factor that happens here is if your head hits the platter, in a lot of cases it will actually dig a groove through your drive and you can see through it. So when you actually open it up, take your platter out, hold it up to the light if you do that, uh, I don't recommend it often depending upon your situation, uh, you can see through the physical platter. It's also the same as if you have the platter and let's say one of the bottom platters is scratched, if you put light, if you flashed a flashlight down below while it's still in the casing, and you've opened the top lid of the platter so that you can see what's going on, you can actually see the light come through it, even though the top platter might not be scratched. You'll actually see a light amount of, of light through the platter. So you can tell right away if it's scratched and you're going to go through heads like crazy trying to do a recovery. <clears throat> that was another girlfriend that didn't work out for that hard drive, I don't think. She actually destroyed the whole thing. Anybody remember courier modems? Anybody here old enough in here to remember a courier modem? Yeah? Did, uh, did you guys get to where you could tell when you walked by the courier modem that it was sending data and receiving data and how fast it was going? Yeah, you kind of got used to it. It's like you see these blinky lights on a courier, in front of a courier modem. And so, you know, if you're a bulletin board guy or something like that, you knew, you could almost tell who was on. It was kind of like you could read the lights. That's what happens in data recovery. The data recovery software is very similar. It is a fairly, uh, almost all of them have agreed on some of the nomenclature that actually happens. And this bar that you see, this gray bar across the top, if you start using any actual data recovery software that's used for high-end stuff, and even some free software, there's a guy in Russia who wrote a package that's called MHDD which is a terrific package. It does a great job of like scanning a hard drive and telling you, you know, certain things. It can actually bypass the bias on your computer and talk directly to the hard drive. So in some cases where you can't even talk to the hard drive through the computer, it'll skip that. Um, there's also, I would recommend anybody who's actually getting into data recovery is to try to get an Adaptech 1200A controller. It's an old RAID controller, uh, but they're like 12 bucks on eBay or something. This particular software knows how to talk to that controller and that board better than it does most other ones, and there's better error recovery and better error correction going on, and you'll have a better chance of actually getting your data off of it and you know, just spend 12 bucks on the board and just plug it in and boot on this free piece of software, MHDD. Uh, and it'll look a lot like this particular bar across the top. There'll be other content, and it's a little scary. You have to kind of get used to the commands. But you, I don't want to go through each and every error because they're very detailed. There's a lot of content that goes on there. But it does look a lot like watching uh, a, a courier modem, and you can start to see what's actually going on. The big one there at the end is the UNC, which means it was uncorrectable. For some reason, I was not able to actually read a particular block, and then it will cause an abort. That is typically what's happening when you have this SA area. Now I'm going to take a look at the arm here. On the arm, 
physically, you have a chip, and this is a preamp. In a previous speech, I showed how the heads of the hard drive worked a little bit better. It's a lot more like a speaker than you would ever believe. Basically, the content that's written to your platter is not written in zeros and ones. That's a, that's a common misconception. People think I got a zero and I got a one on my hard drive. It is more like a sound wave being encoded and written to your platter. It is actually a waveform and physically causes that up and down signature, and it's not as smooth as a high and a low, and I have a zero and a one. It's encoded and written to it. So on the way back out, it has to be re-decoded and then passed through a physical amp, basically, is what you're looking at. So on the board, there's this preamp, and it basically increases the value of the signal coming from the head after it's been read from the platter. Now, there's two types of preamps that I know of that are on physical drives. One is actually soldered on and physically is a chip. The other one is actually done with glue. Basically, they make a little circuit board, they put a little drop of glue on it, and they slap the chip on it. What do you think happens to this when it gets really hot? <laughs> yeah, I think the chip falls off or it causes a problem with a, a connector or something like that. The real problem is, is that there's no easy way to tell if the problem that you're having is the preamp. You, you either have a problem with your head, you have a problem with the circuit board, or you have a problem with this preamp. What ends up happening is it's actually easier to replace the entire arm with the heads on them than to try to go and replace the preamp itself. And the voice coil again is another thing that I have talked about in a previous talk where I tell you how it works and go through the whole structure of how it's basically the tail end of a speaker. The issue here is that sitting above this there's a piece of metal and it's going to fly down in a second and you're going to see it. If you're going to take the arm off of your hard drive if you mess with this coil in any way, shape, or form, it will completely mess you up and you will not be able to use this arm, this head, any piece of this. So you have to be very cautious. You don't stick a screwdriver in here and pry this piece of metal off. It is only held on typically with magnets. In some cases, there's a screw on each side and you take the screw off and then it's very powerful and you have to pull very hard to get it off. And you actually use another magnet to pull it off. You basically are going to put a magnet on top of it and pry it off with a magnet from the top. Uh, but don't stick a screwdriver in there. That's pretty bad. <clears throat> All right, so the cause of the click is basically going to end up being one of four things. You're either looking at this scratched area, which you'll know right away if you see on a platter. If you opened up your hard drive, and let's say you made kind of a clean environment, and you put a HEPA filter. I have a clean room. Not everybody does. There's a couple of ways to make a clean room or a clean box. But if you're going to mess around with a data recovery and you don't want to spend $2,000 or do something else with it, you may as well screw with it yourself because it's the only way you're probably going to see your data if you're not going to spend, you know, I typically charge around $600, $700 depending upon the type of drive and what I'm dealing with on a standard drive. But most of the other higher end companies are typically charging around $2,000. You still struggle with it in the middle of that quite a bit. But if you're not going to spend at least that, you can take it apart, take a look at it yourself, just try to do it in the cleanest area possible. But if you see a scratch like this, then you typically know you're looking at your SA area, and that's what's causing the click. That it's not the head, that it's not the arm itself, that there's, you may have head damage if you've got a scratch like this, but it's not typically going to be the head itself that actually is the problem. So your other area is the head itself right here. In a lot of cases, this head is still good. If I can actually back the head off and do something else with it to repair or to replace it, I can still use this head. Then you have the preamp, <clears throat> which you just may as well, again, replace the whole thing. You just have no idea if it's going to be the preamp or not. And then you physically have your PCB board. Now, in previous talks, I talked about this part, too, where it's fairly easy to replace. I'm going to try to do a couple of different things with this particular board now and try to show you what I might be able to use for a recovery. <clears throat> so, in this particular case, uh, I'm going to try to do what's called a live swap. This works in the neighborhood of about 25 to 30 percent of the time on a hard drive. Basically, you still have the same process. You've got to find another hard drive that's identical, as close to matching as possible, that you can use for what's called a donor drive. I need a good drive that can actually boot and run in order to repair a bad drive in order to get what I need off of it. <clears throat> now, if I power it up, I connect it to my computer, and I'm going to tell you something that like everybody always says, don't ever do that, 